You're listening to Best Forevers, a podcast for kindred spirits, a podcast that encourages you to love more on your friends and to further consider the issues that plague friendships. I'm Elisa Lucas, and I'm currently on spring break. And I know you're probably like, well, congratulations to you. (laughs) But I tell you that because being on spring break has led to this episode for two primary reasons. First, on spring break, I've been watching a lot of America's Next Top Model, as you might recall from the last episode. (laughs) And I think I'm on cycle seven, so I'm really making it happen over the spring break. And one of the things that I've sort of noticed by watching so many of the episodes is that oftentimes reality shows have someone who's annoying, right? And they might be edited that way. Or that might just be who they are. And so any show you watch, whether it be The Bachelorette, um, it's America's Next Top Model, Survivor, there's always someone or more than one someone who is annoying. And one of the things is I'm not typically annoyed by annoying people on these TV shows. Like I, I try to think, well, you know, what would you do if you were on an island with all these people? Or I imagine the stress of being a certain way as a model on this sh- on, a- on America's Next Top Model is critical. So I try to think of like reasons why they might be, be behaving that way other than just being annoying on purpose. But one of the things that I do find annoying is people who are mean to annoying people. That's the annoying behavior. <laughs> And I think you see that a lot. You see a lot of conflict that occurs over what people perceive as annoying and then how they respond to it. The second reason why I wanted to do this episode is because being on spring break essentially gives folks a break from those annoying friends, the roommates, the whoever, their professors. I mean, I'm sure there's a couple of people who are glad I'm on spring break this weekend. Okay, fair. I realize that for some people, I am annoying. In fact, they probably turned on this podcast and then they were annoyed by my voice or my laughter or the fact that I sometimes pronounce things incorrectly. And they were like, oh, bye. And, you know, I get it. There's so many podcasts out there. So I understand that I might be annoying. And I think I've always <laughs> kind of connected it to the movie What About Bob, where Bill, Mar- uh, Bill Murray's character, Bob, tells his therapist, I'm like Neil Diamond, you either love me or you hate me. And if you love me, I'm probably probably not annoying. And if you hate me, you're probably annoyed by every single thing I do say, or even when I breathe. <laughs> I once had a student tell the class, he goes, my ex-girlfriend broke up with me because she didn't like the way I breathed. And I was like, what? <laughs> so sometimes, you know, maybe our annoyances go a little too far. <laughs> So uh, overall, it reminds me, though, of this bit by Dane Cook um, that he does about there being just one person in a friendship group that no one likes. He says something like, oh, God, there's Brian. Brian's coming. Everyone, watch out. Here comes Brian. Oh, God, fucking Brian's coming. Like, that's his name. Fucking Brian's coming. (laughs) And then he also talks about douchebag Karen, who's always a bag of douche. And although he may be pushing the line for some people, he brings up a real-life experience that we may have all had. We have annoying friends. Or perhaps we're that annoying friend. So, in fact, Dan Cook says, if you don't think what he says is true, you're probably that Karen or that fucking Brian's coming. So today we're talking about annoying friends. We're going to talk about those behaviors, being irritated by those behaviors, and how we can cope with friends who annoy us. Annoying communicators is a topic I cover in my dark side of interpersonal communication class. And today we're applying it, though, wholly and solely to friendship. The primary article that students read for this class is a chapter entitled Social Allergens and the Reactions They Produce, Escalation of Annoyance and Disgust in Love and Work by Cunningham, Barbie, and Druin. So in this article, they talk about annoying behaviors like having allergies. And when I found out I had allergies, I was super pissed off. I was like, what? What am I even allergic to? Apparently the outdoors, which is probably why I'm so indoorsy and watch 97 episodes of America's Next Top Model in a day and have two podcasts so that I can breathe, right? But I do like this metaphor. I know you're probably going to go, well, my friend isn't dust and I don't sneeze around my friend. So that isn't, that doesn't, That doesn't play. That doesn't track. But I think it is actually a good metaphor to really think about these behaviors. So let's go ahead and talk about how these authors talk about it. 
So for example, yes, we're going to talk about your friend like dust or pollen (laughs) with their annoying behaviors. The authors call these social allergens and they're defined as, quote, a behavior or situation created by another that many uh, see as unpleasant, but is not as strongly aversive to objective observers, end quote. So for example, those of us who might be allergic to dust, we are more likely to see a house or feel like a house that is dusty to be more offensive than someone who doesn't have a dust allergy. So you can see that there is a lot of perhaps individual differences when it comes to what is considered to be annoying behavior. And let's be real, allergies are annoying. (laughs) They are really annoying. So Let's take it further. Imagine being allergic to dust and how repeated or prolonged exposure might impact you, right? So that when you have to stay the night in a dusty house versus just stopping by and dropping something off, right? That's a completely different experience. And so that's the same for annoying behaviors. And it's like when people have allergies, they're like, why? And no thanks. And and there's just this reaction of disgust or irritation. And the authors call this the social allergy, and it's defined as, quote, a reaction of hypersensitive disgust or annoyance to a social allergen, end quote. So when I go outside, I have a hypersensitive disgust or annoyance to leaves and dirt or whatever else is really just making my nose run and my eyes hurt and my head hurt and just making it difficult to breathe, like knock it off. So some of the things that we might hear people say There are just some common phrases people use when they are talking about annoying behaviors, right? They'll say things like, it's starting to grate on my nerves, it's getting under my skin, you're beginning to rub me the wrong way, it's becoming a pet peeve of mine, I'm really getting tired of this, this annoying behavior, you're starting to drive me crazy, it's getting to be a sore spot with me, and I'm just getting fed up with it. So you can start to see that when people say things like that, that there is something that is annoying them and they're probably having some sort of reaction to it, much like an actual allergy. So there are four types of social allergies that I wanted to talk about, and they're based on two dimensions, including intentionality and personalism. So as you might guess, intentionality is about whether or not that person is purposefully behaving in a way to tick you off, or is that just the way that they are, right? So are they being intentional and trying to get under your skin on purpose, or do they just do it and that's the way you react? The other dimension is personalism. Does the annoying person direct their behavior at a specific person like you, or do they annoy everyone? So there are some people who just don't discriminate when it comes to irritating others. Everyone is irritated by them, (laughs) right? Or they're just people who direct it towards one person because they know it will annoy them. And so when you take those two, whether it's intentional or not intentional, personal or not personal, it comes up with four types of social allergies. So I'm going to talk about them in order of the negative impact. So from the most problematic to the least problematic. Okay, so the first one is called intrusions and dominance. And this is considered to be intentional and personal. So your friend intends to annoy you specifically. And it reminds me of the idea that we talk about in my dark side class that we always hurt the ones we love because that tr- that statement can be true because we know how to push people's buttons. So if we've been friends with someone for even five months, we probably know a button we can push. But certainly if you've been friends for five years or 10 years or even 20, that you might know what's going to annoy them. And so if you refrain from doing that because you annoy them, that might be very effective and competent communication happening in that friendship. But if you specifically do something because it's that person and you know it will annoy them, then you're under intrusions and dominance. This social allergen causes the most problems because, quote, the behavior is regarded as obnoxious if it applies they're trying to impose on another person, end quote. So some of the things that can happen in friendship that would fall under this is when your friend commands you to do something or is controlling about how you spend your time or who you spend your time with or what you do or what you're wearing, and they're just really critical of you. And this actually happened to me one time 
Um, we were going to San Francisco for a trip, and one of the things that we were going to do is go out to a club in San Francisco, which seems super fun for someone who grew up in Lansing, Michigan, and has spent most of her time since leaving home in small college towns, right? And so the people who were going were buying new outfits and things like that. So at this time, I went and shopped at... uh, air quotes, the mall, because there wasn't a lot there. I shopped at Express. I found some new jeans that I really liked. And then this black lace top um, that was is longer. It's it could have been a dress on some people, I think, but I was wearing it as as a top. I think I still have it. So I might take a picture and post it. But so I got home and I told my friend who I was going with, I was like, oh, I got this outfit. And she was like, come over, show me. And we lived in the same apartment complex. So I went over and I went into her bathroom and I changed into the outfit. And then I come out and she goes, oh, that's what you got? I thought you would want to wear something a little bit more form-fitting. And she made me feel really bad and was like, you can't wear that or you're not sexy enough or you're not this, that, or the other thing. And then she shows me her outfit and it's essentially, oh, gosh, what do you even call them? It's like the things from the olden days. Um, oh, crap, what are they called? Everyone sitting at home going, ah, this is what it is. All right, folks, I had to pause there and go search, and it took like 10 minutes. She was wearing a corset, which is clearly <laughs> really tight, and she's like a size zero, and I've never been a size zero except maybe when I came out of my mom's womb. And so I felt like she was being really critical of me and how I looked and that I didn't look in a way that she saw as acceptable to be seen with her. And so I found that to be annoying. And it's still something I remember today. Like, And it's like, that's not who I am. Why would you want me wearing something that makes me feel uncomfortable? So that's not something that we want in a friendship, right? We don't want people to make us feel bad, to demand we do things, or to erode our self-esteem by being critical. Because in friendships, what's more important is that we support each other, that we're non-judgmental that we are accepting of other people. And typically what we see is that friendships are considered to be on the same playing field. They're equal. And so when one person is more controlling or demanding or dominant, then it becomes really annoying and problematic. So I was, oh, but here's an amendment to that story. So we went, I wore my outfit because I felt comfortable and I'm always trying to be who I am. And guess who got more compliments on their outfit? Uh, this girl. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Seriously, I'll find the top. It probably doesn't fit me, so I'm not going to wear it on. <laughs> but I will get you a shot of it. It was pretty cute. <laughs> Just trust me. <laughs> the second type of social allergen is what is called insensitivity and non-reciprocity. And this is considered to be the most, the next most offensive because when a behavior becomes labeled as annoying... Once we see it as annoying, it becomes more rapid of a reaction. Like, as soon as we label it, it's like, boom. It's like, oh, that's so annoying, like, immediately. This group of social allergen is considered to be unintentional and personal. So that means they're not doing the behaviors on person, but it feels like it to the person that's getting that behavior or is around that behavior or is just perceiving this person to be problematic. And so... For example, we're expected to be attentive to the verbal and nonverbal behaviors of our friends. And so even a minor behavior can seem really intentional rather than impulsive. So interrupting someone, that might just be like excitement, right? A lot of times we don't learn to listen and we only listen to be able to share our side of a story. So sometimes we get too excited or we're just listening for that opening and we interrupt other people when we do it. And sometimes I have to catch myself because I am like, even in the classroom, I'm enjoying what someone's saying. And it's like, you just want to get in there and connect. But here's the thing. That's annoying. (laughs) People don't like being interrupted. And I can tell you, I try to be mindful of interruptions, and I probably have interrupted people, and I don't like it when people interrupt me either. I also had a friend in graduate school when I was at Michigan State, and she was seemed very excited about everything, and even though I don't think she meant to interrupt me, it was just something that every single time we were together, it would happen. And so then every time that I was with her, I would get really annoyed. And finally, and this is so 
horrible that she interrupted me. And I was like, well, don't ask me questions if you're not going to wait for my answer. You know, something along that effect with like a real negative tone and just, oh, you know, I'm just irritated with you. And it's like that if this person is your friend, that might not be the best way to respond it respond to them. And so I don't think that she was meaning to do it on purpose, but it was something that she should probably be aware of. And I should be aware of how I respond to people when I do get irritated, because this is what like I don't like, what I talked about at the top of the episode, that when people get irritated, they become nastier than the the annoying behavior. And I think that becomes even more problematic than annoying behaviors overall. And so not a very proud moment for me. And I try to be mindful of that. And I don't think that I, (laughs) I hope I don't respond in that way anymore. (laughs) But some of the behaviors that people might participate in that we'll see as insensitive and non-reciprocal is uh, not being attentive in conversations. So for example, if you're always on your phone and you're not paying attention to the person who's talking to you, that is not perhaps intentional, but how would you feel on the other side if you didn't have your phone, for example, and the person you were with was on their phone for the entire lunch or dinner? That would be, you would feel like it was intentional because it's certainly personal because it's you and them eating dinner and they're not paying attention to you. And I just remember this episode. I don't think it was the Kardashians. I think it was one of the spinoffs like Chloe and, you know, Courtney go somewhere, <laughs> New York, Miami, something like that. And so Kim came out to visit and she's out to lunch with Courtney and she's on her phone the whole time. And so Courtney's trying to tell her what's going on and telling her funny stories and she's getting no response from Kim. And so what she actually does, she says, like, put her phone you know, put your phone away. And she doesn't. And so (laughs) Courtney gets up. She leaves the table. She goes to the valet. She gets her car. She goes in the car back to her workplace, to the clothing place that they they ran and they owned. I think it was called Dash. That's it. (laughs) And Kim's still sitting at the table on her phone and didn't even recognize. And then she came back to Dash and was like, I can't believe you did that. And she's like, but how long did it take you to realize that I was no longer there? And I think that's what's important is like, Kim might not have meant to do that to Courtney, but if Courtney could get up, leave, go to the valet and get the car and leave, then (laughs) that might, that's really inattentive, okay? And super annoying. Oh, here's a good one. We talked about this last episode in the episode Asking for a Friend. I talked to you and introduced you to the idea, or maybe you've heard of it before, called an ask hole. And an ask hole is someone who ask for advice, and then they never take it, and then they talk about the same topic over and over again. So this would fall under insensitivity and non-reciprocity because when people complain, ignore advice, and complain again, it becomes really annoying. And it's probably not meant to be intentional, but if you ask the same person for advice all the time, then they're always getting the complaints, and they always know that you're not listening to them, and you're not taking the advice, and then here you come again complaining about it again and asking for more advice and why should they do it if you're not going to take it, right? And then another one besides interruptions is when people dominate the conversation and the research article talks about engaging in monologues. And I know monologues are theater. I remember taking drama class and doing the monologue from Goodfellas because that's how I do drama, right? As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Here's the thing. I did that when I was a senior in high school. Still remember it. (laughs) Which is probably annoying. (laughs) But one of the things that you have to consider with this particular group is that you might not mean to do this behavior, but it starts to feel intentional to the other person. And that the person on the receiving end, you have to know they don't intend to do it, but something has to be done because why always have to be on the other end of an interruption or a monologue or an attentive behavior. It starts to feel like you're not getting out of the friendship what the other person is getting from you. And we've talked about that before, right? Feeling under-benefited. And so people might not mean to do this, but you can create a rift in your friendship because it seems intentional instead of impulsive. 
The third one is annoying habits and personal qualities. And this causes the strongest disgust in anyone, right? So when I think of disgust, when you smell something rotten, that is what disgust looks like on people's face. And so a lot of times this category might include, for example, people who might not keep up with hygiene and people can find that really annoying. Like if you are in the workplace or you are sitting on public transportation with people. These behaviors are unintentional and not personal. So it basically means these are people just the way they are. They chew their food that way because that's how they've always chewed it, right? Like this is just part of who they are. And they might have zero concept of how their behaviors impact other people. So if you have a friend that's a real close talker, gets in and violates space violations, it's just like always who they are, but you're like, can you get out of my my bubble? <laughs> so these folks, according to uh, the chapter, do not closely monitor themselves. They don't ask for feedback. It might be unaware of possessing any mannerisms that people find annoying, such as the habit of sighing loudly. Like sighing like, <sighs> I used to have someone in my class. I, actually, this happens quite a bit. I call it huffing and puffing. When people do the, <sighs> and it's like, are you annoyed right now? <laughs> what is your problem? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. You're like, you do this noise, <laughs> right? And I think people don't realize sometimes that they do those behaviors and other people find it annoying. <laughs> so some of those behaviors include unpleasant sounds, orders, appearance, often or frequently expressing negative emotions. Um, so they're just someone who's always, like I think of Eeyore, like, wah, wah, like all the time, <laughs> you know, where it's just like a cloud over them. And so it's just like who they are. And, you know, maybe it's depressing for other people to be around them. And so it's like, how do you sort of deal with that? And then another behavior might be they just might be incompetent in performing tasks. So they might have a job which doesn't fit their skill. And so it can have an impact on their coworkers or on their friends, like if you're doing some together, something together, like, oh, hey, come over and you can help me put this thing together. You know, my friend Sarah, who's been on the podcast a lot, is always like, hey, do you want to help me put this thing together? Let's craft or this sort of thing. And I'm like, I don't know how to do any of that. <laughs> right? And I'm probably pretty annoying to her because it's like, how do you use a glue gun? <laughs> or I didn't hammer it the right way in the sense of making it go in the way it's supposed to or See, I don't even know how to talk about it because although I do like crafting and having, I don't know, a crafternoon, like from our Valentine's Day episode, but I'm not very, I don't feel good in those tasks. Like I don't feel confident about them. So if I'm trying to help someone or they're trying to help me, I'm sure because I'm insecure in that area or I'm just not um, as crafty as other people, that can be annoying. So I'm like, ask me to do crafty things at your own risk because it's not intentional and it's not personal. <laughs> you want me to draw a straight line? Well, you've asked the wrong person. <laughs> but I promise that I won't uh, loudly through it. <laughs> so one of the things I always think of is the Parks and Rec episode with Andy Samberg, and his character is named Carl, and he is the animal control person. And so when they have him on, he just talks at the same level. And so it's about to get loud, so I don't want your ear holes to be blown by my voice. But this is Andy Samberg's character, Carl. Hi, I'm Carl! And it's like the whole time that is his energy through everything. He could be like, pass the salt! <laughs> right? I leaned back on that one because I don't mean to blow up people's ears. Because what? It's annoying, right? And so these this would probably be where... Um, my students' breathing would fall. This would be where people's chewing of food falls. It might just be annoying habits that people have, like burping or those sorts of things. And with these habits or annoying behaviors, I think it is important to be mindful and aware of ourselves, but some people aren't completely all the way there. And so these can be really sensitive in which to bring up, like, I don't like the way you breathe, or can you close your mouth when you chew your food? It's disgusting. Then that would probably go back to intrusion and dominance. You're being really critical, or the way that you say it might not be very helpful. Because some of these things that people do in this category, they might not be able to change. Like, how do you change breathing from after breathing the same way for 23 years? Like, you might need 
like professional help and who can afford that? Or it's like, as long as I get air, who cares? <laughs> right? And so, you know, like I am a mouth breather and that's probably really annoying to people, but it's not like at the age of 40 that I'm going to suddenly change and be a nose breather like the rest of y'all. <laughs> okay. So sometimes it's like something might be annoying, but maybe we shouldn't be so annoyed by it because it might not be something that the other person can change. And then the final category is norm violations and discrepant behaviors. And these are considered to be intentional, like people do these behaviors, but it's not personal. So they do it to everyone. (laughs) This is the do not discriminate. I'm annoying to every single person I come across. (laughs) So this would be obviously the most subjective. So what you find annoying in someone is not what I might find annoying in them. And so this varies in terms of behaviors. And so typically what falls here, though, is those behaviors and values are dissimilar to our own. And so they might seem like, hey, that's cool or novel or or rare or unique or intriguing. And then later it becomes super irritating. Like, oh, they're super fun. They always have all the information. Oh, wait, they're a big gossip. And listening to them talk badly about people every single single timer together is super annoying. Other things that might fall here is lying. And it's like, oh, you might not realize it at first, but then as it goes on, it becomes something that is more annoying. But they don't do it on purpose, but they do it to everyone, right? And so that's something to keep in mind. So what are the behaviors in your friends that you find annoying that other people don't, right? And so one of the things that I find annoying, (laughs) oh gosh, This is full self-disclosure. I actually do not like when people... (laughs) Now I'm embarrassed by the things I find annoying. (laughs) And some of you are like, you're doing it right now. It's the laugh. Um, And I'm also a snorter, which some people find annoying, but that's okay. Um, I find it annoying when people search specifically for a compliment. So it's like, well, I'm not, you know, I don't know. I think I did a good job, and I just, I don't know. And it's like waiting for you to be like, oh, my God, you're so amazing. And when people are searching for a compliment, it's like, well, keep fishing and maybe a different lake because this lake is not going to bite. <laughs> and it's one of those things because my belief in life, my philosophy is that a compliment comes when someone else has recognized something that you've done. And I remember – receiving a, gosh, feedback from a professor that was very positive. And another professor said that person never compliments people in that way. So that really meant something. And to me, hearing that made it more special. And so when people are just like, give me a compliment, I'm like, well, it doesn't mean as much, right? It's like, well, then I could just go around and just do that to anyone and but is it real? Right. And I, and I try to be like real, but not mean and, you know, and call people out or that sort of thing. But I don't know. <laughs> I sound stupid talking about this. <laughs> so I guess this is the point of the show when I say, what annoys you about your friends? <laughs> and tell me, because I guess the point is this, that maybe I should be a little embarrassed here, right? Because the idea is that this is subjective. And some of you listening might be like, yes, and you're snapping along with me. Like, I hate when people do that. And other people are like, give someone a compliment. Make their day. Don't you talk about kindness and friendliness in your podcast? I do. And I am friendly and I try to be kind. And But sometimes it's just too much fishing, you know? It's like, I'm indoorsy, remember? I don't like fishing. (laughs) So I think, though, the point here is that I could be more mindful of the things I specifically think are annoying because in other people, they won't see that. And so I shouldn't get irritated with someone who's just maybe feeling a little low that day and might just need a couple kind words and a smile to change things around for them. And so Really talking about annoying behaviors is being mindful if you're annoying. It's kind of like, let's read the room. But then also, your response can be more annoying than the annoying behavior. So we have to think about how we respond to our friends and to the behaviors and why we think they're annoying and how we can go about solving it, right? So before we get into really 
coping with it as apparently I need to cope with people who are looking for compliments. There are a number of things that are related to being annoyed. One of the things is repeated exposure. So if it's you live with your best friend or you see your best friend every single day and they interrupt you every single day, then there can be feelings of being unable to escape the situation. And I think a good sort of application here would be when you go home for the holidays and you have family members who annoy you and you simply can't get away because you're expected to be there and you're expected to be at dinner and you're expected to be polite and all those sorts of things that you just cannot escape it. And that can also include like prolonged exposure. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, uh, my friend Tara was on. We talked about traveling together in the episode Au revoir, as you might remember. I don't know how to pronounce that word very well. <laughs> and one of the things we talked about is annoying behaviors if we know annoy each other. And I think that's one of the times where you can see annoying behaviors in friendships is when you spend a long period of time together, like traveling together. So how do you manage that? How do you cope with repeated exposure and prolonged exposure? The next thing that impacts or is related to these annoying behaviors is that your body experiences in reaction to annoying behaviors can trigger cognitive memories, as the article talks about, which makes the allergy stronger. So let's say you find it annoying when someone, (laughs) I don't know, leaves the cap off the detergent in the living room of the living room and the laundry room that you both share right and so that experience might be like not only do they leave the caps off the detergent they don't put their dirty dishes in the dishwasher and they don't put their clean dishes away and they leave the towels on the floor and the that 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 and you got a laundry list of everything that you hate about your friend right so that experience triggers these memories of other things that make you annoyed and so in that moment you might be even more annoyed cuz it's not just about the cap it's about the dishes and the laundry and the da, da, da. it's all all the things that you find annoying, the bath towels, it all comes back. The next thing is what the authors call symbolic interactions. And really what this was referring to is that it can be really hard to accept people completely with annoying behaviors and all. And one of the markers of friendship is to accept people. So can you accept your friends even down to the sound of their voice and being uh, perhaps critical of what you're wearing and gossiping and being on their phone and the way they breathe and the way they burp and the way they interrupt. And you're all like, no, (laughs) you've just given us a list of things to be like, maybe when is that episode about breaking up with friends coming out? Soon. Don't worry. (laughs) But let's not break up a friendship over an annoying behavior. (laughs) So it can be really hard to accept people behaviors. And I think one of the reasons is we think we know the reasons why people do things. Well, they don't put their dishes away because they're a disrespectful person and they are rude or they do this. They interrupt because they think they're better than I am, or they won't give me a compliment because they don't like other people getting attention. Now, oftentimes we think we know what people's motivations are. And here's the thing, we're probably wrong most of the time. (laughs) And so how do we know what people's motivations are? is if they tell us what those motivations are. We can assume, but I think we all know about assuming. It makes an ass out of you and me, right? So we might, if I say you're trying to determine people's motivations, the one suggestion suggestion I do have is if you list out several motivations so that you are thinking about more than one reason why people might do the behavior, right? Um, The next one is that we can assign negative attributions See, he is selfish. He took my fries and like Joey on Friends, I don't share food. (laughs) Or he borrows money from me, but he won't let me borrow money from him. He is selfish, right? So we can then start to attribute um, different characteristics to people based on their behaviors and the motivations we think they have. And one of the things is that individually we have different susceptibilities. And I think the last category that focuses on norm violations and discrepant behaviors, like fishing for compliments, for example, is more likely to annoy someone who's that's their pet peeve, right? Or, for example, I'm what you call a highly sensitive person. 
And I can link to some information about what that is, but I'll just give you my definition of it. It's this idea that all these sounds and noises and movements and all these things happening are really overwhelming to me. And so I can go to a basketball game and because I know it's going to be overwhelming with sight and sound and just everything happening, like the squeaking and the shoes. The <laughs> and some people are like, please don't do that. <laughs> That's annoying. <laughs> um, I can go there and do that. But then if I'm traveling and we get in a long line and it's hot and I'm hungry and all there's all these people and they're making strange noises and they're doing all sorts of things, I get really overwhelmed in those situations. So as someone who's highly sensitive, I'm more likely to be susceptible to some annoying behaviors. So I talk about this in my classroom because when people are having side conversations in class, that's extremely distracting to me because it's extra sound. And so it makes it more difficult for me to teach them. So um, I try to say, like, keep those to a minimum. Like, I know it can be, I try to make class fun and let's talk about these things. But if we're talking about content, let's kind of keep that down to a minimum because I want to be sure I'm doing my best in front of you and that this isn't just a teacher to student, student to teacher, we're in a classroom environment, and we share that responsibility together, right? But other people might be more susceptible for being annoyed by criticism if they've received it from a lot of people, right? We could be, if we feel like our attention should be on us, so for example, those who are narcissists, according to the chapter, are going to be more sensitive to negative behaviors, right? So there are some things that might be you might be more annoyed because of some other factor of your personality or who you are or the experiences that you've had. The last thing is that annoying behaviors is related to loss and anxiety. And the chapter has this really interesting quote, and then I'll talk a little bit more through it. It says, quote, a person who performs an intrusive, insensitive, proscribed, or vulgar behavior not only introduces a negative element into a relationship, but suggests the lack or the loss of expected positive elements. So as humans, we appreciate and want to maximize positive behaviors, and we want to avoid negative behaviors. So when someone creates this behavior that brings in negativity, then in our mind it might wash away that positivity. We're more likely to remember negative things than we are positive things. And so depending on the category, the chapter talks about some of the feelings that people might have. So the first one we talked about was da, 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 intrusions and dominance, and that is intentional and personal. And people can have a, a loss of feeling respected, that when people are critical of you, that you don't feel like they respect you. And this can be the most dangerous type of behaviors or categories of social allergens because people fear physical and psychological abuse, right? That dominating, the commanding, the taking away time, isolating, any of those things that people do, and then on top of that being critical, they're not respected and they might fear abuse. And the next one we talked about insensitivity and non-reciprocity, which is unintentional and personal. And in unintentional and personal, they have a loss of feeling nurtured, right? And they fear of selfishness and inequality. So think of the Kardashians, right? Like Courtney felt left out and then her sister was not giving her any time. And it was just, you know, being inattentive or disrupting people or doing the monologues. You don't feel like you're supported or you don't feel like they see you as a friend and that, you know, you start to feel underbenefited. And the third one, which is annoying habits and personal qualities, which is unintentional and not personal. And the third one, we talked about annoying habits and personal qualities. And this is not intentional and it's not personally directed. And so these were like Carl from Parks and Rec where he's shouting the whole time, right? There's a loss of idealization, right? So you might see someone in a positive light, but then they're a close talker or they burp in your face a lot or those sorts of things. And you just don't see them. <laughs> in a certain way anymore. They might not be on that pedestal, right? It's, so it might be like in relationships where you're getting along and then all of a sudden someone like farts in front of you and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> but it's not the end of the world because, I mean, we all fart. <laughs> I'm not wrong about that. I might be wrong about fishing for compliments depending on your point of view, but I'm not wrong about that. <laughs> they also have a fear of social ostracism, which means they can be isolated and might experience loneliness because people don't be, want to be around them because of the way they behave or the way they smell or the things that they do that they're not aware of. And that, that one makes me a little sad. Again, why I might get a very protective of those people who um, are annoying and then being treated poorly because of it. 
The last one we talked about was the subjective norm violations and discreptant behaviors, which is intentional but not personal. And there can be a loss of trust and a fear of betrayal, right? And so in this sort of thing, it's like I have values, I have these beliefs, and it's the opposite of what I do. And so we must not have anything in common. Like how can we be friends if we don't agree on this thing together so there can be a loss of trust or that they might betray you in some way. And so you can see annoying behaviors. You might be like, well, this whole episode is annoying because annoying behaviors, that's stupid, it's small. But they can create huge rifts in it based on what the behaviors are. Like think about the those first behaviors that we talked about, intrusions and dominance, critical, abusive, controlling, and the second one, insensitivity, non-reciprocity, not being paid attention to, your advice is not valued, you're being interrupted, so you don't feel valued. You have these behaviors that are just, oh, you are just being you, and that is problematic for other people, like, fucking Brian's coming, right? And it's like, I think that's what Dane is getting at, is that someone is just annoying because, right? Like, that's who they are. And then the last one is much more subjective, and some of that might seem a little bit more petty or something like that, but it's working through it and knowing what annoys us about our friends and what we can do about it. And yeah, this might be annoying, but think about loss of feeling respected, nurtured, trust, you know, something that's ideal or idealized, fearing abuse or inequality or betrayal or being isolated, like those things are human feelings. And our friendships are meant to be helpful and bring us good in the world. And yeah, we have to work through things like annoying behaviors and, and other things that we talk about on this podcast. But it's about enjoying a relationship, that our friends mean something to us, that they bring us lots of positive things in it and they help us maintain positive well-being. Like, we need these things, right? (laughs) And so, yeah, there might be a lot of annoying friends. Um, Thought Catalog online came up with 14 types of friends who annoy us the most. And I will give you a couple of them. (laughs) Well, you know I'd be annoyed by this. The I don't watch television friend. (laughs) And so the the online article says, really? I guess you just read books all day, do hot yoga, meditate. You're aware there's something out there called pop culture, right? Congratulations. You just excluded being able to have a relevant conversation with 96% of the population, right? And so that might be something that annoys people, like not doing some of the things or being able to connect with people on something that most people do. <laughs> The it wasn't meant to be friend. They only use this phrase when trying to rationalize the occurrence of some events in their behavior, almost always involving a romantic relationship. And so (laughs) something like that can, they say, can sound egotistical or that something is trying to control their life. So it wasn't, it was meant to be or it wasn't meant to be. The oversharer is another annoying person that someone, some people might say TMI, too much information. Some people say that this is attention seeking. And so they will shamelessly, as the article say, post anything and everything all day long from a pic of the fat guy on a scooter they saw at Walmart. That's mean. To a not so subtle hint that they got laid last night. Okay. Yeah. That's too much information. <laughs> um. And it's like one of those things they say is you try to ignore them, but they they cannot be stopped, right? Which, <laughs> you know, maybe they can. That seems like some a behavior that can be changed and not so much like breathing. <laughs> oh, this might be me, the I don't have time to date friend. <laughs> they say you can't find a date who meets your standards. You're either trying to date out of your league or you are delusional. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, geez, Louise. Friends, help me. Don't be critical. <laughs> <laughs> they also talk about the overanalyzer, the one who wants to talk about everything. And this might go back to not taking advice and they're always going through these things that I'll pay you back next week, friend. And then it says, no, you won't. You never have. <laughs> but then it goes on to say, and it's OK, we we don't really care. You're our friend and we want you to hang with us money or not. And so there are some people that would find that annoying and other people are like, you know, I just want to be able to be with you. Then we have the ignore and it'll go away friend or the oversimplifier or the I don't care what other people think of me friend or the I'm so over it friend. And so they have these all sorts of different types of behaviors that friends might do that are annoying. But I think that 
it comes down to it, although I would agree that some of those behaviors are annoying, that there might be other behaviors that are specifically happening in the friendship or behaviors that that person does that they're not aware of, which is truly causing that negative response. So let's talk about how we can maybe fix this or cope with it. And so one of the things that's really neat is when I have ideas about advice I want to give you and then I go online and look at stuff and that people have similar information, I'm like, oh my gosh, this WikiHow article is in line with how I would say to cope with an annoying friend. So the first one is changing your approach. And I think that's important to understanding the four different types that you could frame it differently. Like my friend doesn't mean to do that. They're not going to be able to change the way that they breathe, (laughs) you know, those sorts of things. So the first thing they say is to identify how your friend is annoying you. And the article goes on to say, what exactly is your friend doing that is getting on your nerves? Is your friend too clingy? Does your friend gossip or say mean things to you? Is your friend constantly making fun of you? Are you just annoyed by your friend for no reason? (laughs) So the source of the annoyance will help you figure out what you need to do. And if your friend is, for example, too clingy, you can create space. If your friend is being mean and hurtful, you should let them know how you feel. And if you can't identify why you're so annoyed with your friend, you might need to do some self-evaluation. Have you changed yourself or have you outgrown your friend? And I think that is great advice about things to think about. And I think knowing about these four different allergens can help you think about the things that you do, the things that you might not like that your friends do, or things that you're like, that's not a big deal. We don't need to have a conversation. Or this actually is really problematic, kind of like the Courtney and Kim situation. And so we need to talk about it, right? Because then if someone's aware of it and you talk about it and you figure it out, then it might not be annoying anymore. It might not cause a rift or you might not respond in a negative way. So the second thing the WikiHow article says you can do to cope with an annoying friend is to spend together, spend time together in a group. So if you're spending a lot of one-on-one time with someone and they're like super annoying, having in a group can like sort of spread it out. So and spending time alone with them, see see them when they're around other people. This can create a buffer which is can be helpful, but you can also start to see if it's annoying you or how they interact with other people and maybe you've just spent too much time together. So you want to make sure, according to the article, that other people around you, when you hang out with your annoying friend, for example, make plans with some other friends and then invite the annoying friend to come along or eat lunch with a group of people instead of it being just you and your friend. The only thing I have to say about this article when it says your annoying friend, it sounds like Dane Cook. Karen is always a bag of douche or fucking Brian's coming, right? If your friend invites you to go somewhere and you know it only be to the two of you, decline the offer, ask if you can bring someone else along. Like, oh, that day I'm hanging out with so-and-so, is it okay if, that we make this a group thing, right? And the last thing they say is you can limit the amount of contact you have. And this is sort of a lesson that I learned when I was younger, that I felt that I should be able to spend all of my time with a friend and share everything with them and that not be annoyed by them, not be mad at them, that that we're supposed to spend all this time together. And that's not the case. Like, if you want to maintain a friendship, this article says you can create space between the two of you, like spring break. (laughs) Um, This will give you the break from the person to send a signal to the person to change their behavior. I don't know if that's as obvious. Um, One of the things that I might suggest is that you just might be like, you know, I'm taking this weekend off. I'm just going to stay home, that sort of thing. Maybe you need some time to yourself. Maybe you just need a break. Maybe it's a time to do that self-evaluation so you can see if they're doing something that is bothering you or if you're just annoyed with them for no reason. You can go back to number one and and think about it a little bit more. And one of the things I learned from my friend Kat when I was 19 years old is if the person calls and or texts too much, you don't have to respond to them every single time. So only answer them when you want to, or maybe you just do like an every other call. You you know, it's like, I'll get you next time. And, and one of the things is that spaces it out a little bit more, right? And then they also say, if you have to call them back, call them when you're about to do something else. That way you can keep the conversation short. For example, you can call and say, hey, I saw you missed your call. I'm about to eat dinner with my family. What's up? I also think you could send a text that does that. Um, and so that might be helpful too. So here's some other things the article talks about. You could ignore the person when they annoy you because it might be something that they might stop if they realize that you are ignoring them, if they can pick up on it. Um, So if they're always making fun of people and you stop laughing, then they might realize that what they're saying is not going to get a reaction. 
Um, if others have friends have noticed annoying behaviors, all of you should stop responding. Well, that could sometimes it's like let, let's try it out and see if that works. You know, by ignoring uh, ignoring the behaviors, but then if that doesn't work, that might be where you need to have a conversation. Um, but they do say, and this is great advice: when you ignore the person, do not roll your eyes or make a face. That is still a reaction to them, and you can hurt someone's feelings. And again, you're having a worse reaction than perhaps the annoying behavior. The fifth one is encouraging your friend to have other interests, right? And so if you have a clingy friend, encourage them to try a new hobby or spend time with other people, and that can be helpful. So after you change your approach, maybe that doesn't work and you talk to your friend and some of the things you can do is tell your friend how you feel, but you want to think about how you do that, how you sound when you do it. You want to come across as it being constructive or nice and not being like, you, you know, really critical and negative. And so you might even think about what you're going to say and actually practice it before you say it so that you can do it without something that might hurt people's feelings, like an attitude or a tone. You can listen to your friend's point of view. And so one of the things might be you might not understand where they're coming from or their motivations. And you can also come up with a solution together if you're talking about it in terms of maybe texting when you're with your friend. It might be like when we do dinner, I've seen this online where people put their phones in the middle and then they can keep an eye on it and then they're paying attention to each other. And if someone grabs their phone, they pay for dinner. Not a bad deal. (laughs) You can also give your friend time to change, right? It's not going to happen overnight. So if you do talk to them about it, like in terms of the phone, that might be really hard for people to change or to decrease how they're using it. And so that might be something to consider as you're doing it. The other thing that you can do according to the WikiHow article is decide the future of your friendship. Because if you've changed or you've outgrown your friendship, you might want to think about, is this something to end the friendship? Is this something that you're not going to get over? Is there a trial separation, like a spring break or a summer? (laughs) And you truly ending the relationship if necessary. It might just be an extended break that might be needed, kind of like Ross and Rachel, but we were on a break, right? Um, (laughs) Or it could just be, and some things, if it's under the first category of intrusions and dominance, like that might be something that is worth breaking up a relationship over. And we'll be talking about friendship breakups soon here on the podcast so you can get more information about it. So I would say maybe more importantly than thinking about all these great ways to think about it and talking about your friend or ending the relationship as the WikiHow article talks about, but maybe more importantly, you should think about if you're annoying people. So you could be more mindful of how people respond to you and when you do certain things and maybe there's some adjustments that you can make, especially when these are friends and they're people that you care about and you want to spend time with. And if you're annoyed, don't allow that behavior to make you behave badly. And that's one of the things that in the classroom that we talk about is that people just love talking about all the annoying behaviors, but then when we get down to it and we're talking about the dark side of things, that first one of abuse is the dark side of annoying behaviors. But some of the other ones are like, they're not aware of it or that's subjective to me and what I find annoying. But one of the things is that truly that a lot of times the darker behavior of the two is not the annoying behavior. It's how you respond to the annoying behavior. Because if you don't respect the person, you don't like the person, you're irritated with them, you're in a bad mood, then you come at them nastier than you intend to and you would if you're an outsider or someone observing. And so that's something really critical that we have to think about, that we can end up being nastier than that behavior. And most of us don't want to be nasty or that it can be really problematic to the friendship. And in some cases, people are like, nasty behavior is fine because I'm trying to end this relationship anyway. Well, we're going to talk about the different ways in which to break up because there are ways to do it with respect and not being nasty. So until next time, friends, think about taking a break from your friend or thinking about what annoys you because without our friends, who would we be? for listening to Best Forevers. If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe, rate, review, and of course, share with a friend. Please be sure to follow Best Forevers on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Best Forevers Pod, and I'm at Dr. Lisa Lucas on Twitter. You can always find the podcast webpage for more information at bestforeverspod.com and share your stories of friendship by emailing me at bestforeverspod at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support the movement to love on our friends more, check out the podcast on patreon.com forward slash best forever's pod 
Now, friends, check out this recommended podcast that you must get in your ear holes immediately. Hi, I'm Melissa Cummins from The Haunted Ride, a paranormal podcast dedicated to you and your experiences. I know what it's like to have something happen to you that's unexplainable and how it feels to want to tell someone, but you're concerned they may think you're crazy. Whether it's a disembodied voice, an apparition, or something you just can't explain, this is your place to share it. So come tune in with me every week while we discuss anything and everything that falls into our paranormal and supernatural world. Because ghosts are out there, and if you're not careful, they will get you.